With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall, Harry right behind him. Uncle Vernon had to wrestle deadly to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After a minute of confused fighting, in which everyone got hit a lot by the smelting stick, Uncle Vernon straightened up, gasping for breath, with Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard. I mean your bedroom, he wheezed at Harry. Dudley, go. Just go. Harry walked round and round his new room. Someone knew he'd moved out of his cupboard, and they seemed to know he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that meant they'd try again. And this time he'd made sure they didn't fail. He had a plan. The repaired alarm clock rang at six o'clock the next morning. Harry turned off quickly and dressed silently. He mustn't wake the Dursleys. He stole downstairs without turning on any of the lights. He was going to wait for the postman on the corner of Privet Drive and get the letters for number four first. His heart hammered as he crept across the dark hall towards the front door. Ah! Harry leapt into the air. He'd trodden on something big and squashy on the doormat. Something alive! Lights clicked on upstairs, and to his horror, Harry realised that the big squashy something had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying at the foot of the front door in a sleeping bag, clearly making sure that Harry didn't do exactly what he'd been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for about half an hour and then told him to go and make a cup of tea. Harry shuffled miserably off into the kitchen, and by the time he got back, the postman had arrived, right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry could see three letters addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing the letters into pieces before his eyes. Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the letterbox. See, he explained to Aunt Petunia through a mouthful of nails, if they can't deliver them, they'll just give up. I'm not sure that'll work, Vernon. Oh, these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of fruitcake Aunt Petunia had just bought him. On Friday, no fewer than 12 letters arrived for Harry. As they couldn't go through the letterbox, they had been pushed under the door, slotted through the sides, and a few even forced through the small window in the downstairs toilet. Uncle Vernon stayed at home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer and nails and boarded up the cracks around the front and back doors so no one could go out. He hummed tiptoe through the tulips as he worked and jumped at small noises. On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. 24 letters to Harry found their way into the house, rolled up and hidden inside each of the two dozen eggs that their very confused milkman had handed Aunt Petunia through the living room window. While Uncle, v Uncle Vernon made furious telephone calls to the post office and the dairy trying to find someone to complain to, Aunt Petunia shredded the letters in her food mixer. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly? Dudley asked Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at the breakfast table, looking tired and rather ill, but happy. No post on Sundays, he reminded them happily, as he spread marmalade on his newspapers. No damn letters today. Something came whizzing down the kitchen chimney as he spoke and caught him sharply on the back of the head. Next moment, 30 or 40 letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The Dursleys ducked, but Harry leapt into the air trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized Harry around the waist and threw him into the wall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley had run out with their arms over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. They could hear the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off the walls and the floor. That does it, said Uncle Vernon, trying to speak calmly, but pulling great tufts out of his moustache at the same time. I want you all back here in five minutes ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes, no arguments. He looked so dangerous with half his moustache missing that no one dared argue. Ten minutes later, they had wrenched their way through the boarded up doors and were in the car, speeding towards the motorway. Dudley was sniffling in the back seat. His father had hit him round the head for holding them up while he tried to pack his television, video and computer in his sports bag. They drove. And they drove. Even Aunt Petunia didn't dare ask where they were going. 
Every now and then Uncle Vernon would take a sharp turning and drive in the opposite direction for a while. Shake him off, shake him off, he would mutter whenever he did this. They didn't stop to eat or drink all day. By nightfall, Dudley was howling. He'd never had such a bad day in his life. He was hungry, he'd missed five television programmes he'd wanted to see, and he'd never gone so long without blowing up an alien on his computer. Uncle Vernon stopped out at last outside a gloomy-looking hotel on the outskirts of a big city. Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and damp, musty sheets. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, sitting on the windowsill, staring at the lights of passing cars and wondering. They ate stale cornflakes and cold tin tomatoes on toast for breakfast the next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to their table. Excuse me, but is one of you Mr H. Cotter? Only, I've got about a hundred of these at the front desk. She held up a letter so they could read the green ink address. Mr H. Potter, Room 17, Railway View Hotel, Cokeworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing up quickly and following her from the dining room. Wouldn't it be better to just go home, dear, Aunt Petunia suggested timidly, hours later. But Uncle Vernon didn't seem to hear her. Exactly what he was looking for, none of them knew. He drove them into the middle of a forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back in the car and off they went again. The same thing happened in the middle of a ploughed field, halfway across a suspension bridge and at the top of a multi-storey car park. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia, dully, late that afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast, locked them all inside the car and disappeared. It started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley snivelled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The great Humberto's on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with a television. Monday. This reminded Harry of something. If it was Monday, and you could usually count on Dudley to know the days of the week because of the television, then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's 11th birthday. Of course, his birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year, the Dursleys had given him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, you weren't 11 every day. Uncle Vernon was back and he was smiling. He was also carrying a long, thin package and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she asked what he'd bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, everybody out. It was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing at what looked like a large rock way out to sea. Perched on top of the rock was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. One thing was for certain, no television in there. Storm forecast for tonight, said Uncle Vernon gleefully, clapping his hands together. And this gentleman's kindly agreed to lend us his boat. A toothless old man came ambling up to them, pointing, with a rather wicked grin, at an old rowing boat bobbing in the iron-grey water below them. I've already got some rations, said Uncle Vernon. So, all aboard! It was freezing in the boat. Icy sea spray and rain crept down their necks and a chilly wind whipped their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock, where Uncle Vernon, slipping and sliding, led the way to the broken-down house. The inside was horrible. It smelled strongly of seaweed, the wind whistled through the gaps in the wooden walls, and the fireplace was damp and empty. There were only two rooms. Uncle Vernon's rations turned out to be a packet of crisps each and four bananas. He tried to start a fire, but the empty crisp packets just smoked and shriveled up. Could do with some of those letters now, eh? He said cheerfully. He was in a very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody stood a chance of reaching them here in the storm to deliver post. Harry privately agreed, though, he thought, though the thought didn't cheer him up at all. As night fell, the promised storm blew up around them. Spray from the high waves splattered the walls of the hut, and a fierce wind rattled the filthy windows. Aunt Petunia found a few mouldy blankets in the second room and made up a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off to the lumpy bed next door, and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could 
and curl up under the thinnest, most ragged blanket. The storm raged more and more ferociously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned over, trying to get comfortable, his stomach rumbling with hunger. Dudley's snores were drowned by the low rolls of thunder that started near midnight. The lighted dial of Dudley's watch, which was dangling over the edge of the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd be eleven in ten minutes' time. He lay and watched his birthday tick nearer, wondering if the Dursleys would remember at all, wondering where the letter writer was now. Five minutes to go. Harry heard something creak outside. He hoped the roof wasn't going to fall in, although he might be warmer if it did. Four minutes to go. Maybe the house in Privet Drive would be so full of letters when they got back that he'd be able to steal one somehow. Three minutes to go. Was that the sea slapping hard on the rock like that? And two minutes to go. Was that... What was that funny crunching noise? Was the rock crumbling into the sea? One minute to go and he'd be eleven. Thirty seconds. Twenty. Ten. Nine. Maybe he'd just wake Dudley up just to annoy him. Three, two, one. Boom! The whole shack shivered and Harry sat bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside, knocking to come in.